The story that we'll focus on in the message today comes from the book of Exodus, which is in the Old Testament. In fact, it's the second book in the Bible. So if you'd like to read along at home or read the spaces in between the stories that we have each week, it should be a pretty easy one to find. Last week, we were in the 12th and 13th chapters, and we heard the story of the Passover when God led the people out of their enslavement in Egypt. We also heard the story about the crossing of the Red Sea. When the people came right up against the water, the Egyptian army was chasing them, and God parted the sea. They went through on dry land, and the waters closed again. Egypt is now in their past, and they are moving toward the promised land, but they're not going to get there for a little while. And they've fallen into kind of a pattern. God feeds them manna every day and occasionally quails, and they get water from a rock. And Moses has been going up the mountain, and then he comes down and tells them some things about what God is saying to them. And then Moses goes up again and comes back down. And at the point we encounter them in the story today, Moses is up on the mountain. And the people, well, you'll see what happens in the 32nd chapter of the book of Exodus. And I want to let you know one translation choice I'm making or not making. There's a word in this that I'm not translating from Hebrew. It's Elohim. And some of you may have heard that and said, isn't that one of the names for God? Yes, it is, but it's also used for different things. So it can mean the God, a God, or God's plural. So we're just going to leave it as Elohim, and hopefully it'll give us some space to move around in the story. From the 32nd chapter of Exodus. When the people saw that Moses was delayed in coming down the mountain, they went to his brother Aaron and said, Come, make Elohim for us to go before us. As for this Moses, we don't know what has become of him. Aaron said, Take the rings of gold from the ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters and bring them to me. So all the people took their gold earrings and they gave them to Aaron. And Aaron took the gold from them and made a mold, and he cast an image of a calf. The people said, This is Elohim. When Aaron heard this, he built an altar before it, and he proclaimed to the people, Tomorrow shall be a feast day to the Lord. And they rose up early in the morning, and they made burnt offerings and sacrifices of well-being. They sat down and ate and drank, and they rose up to revel. Meanwhile, on the mountain, the Lord said to Moses, Go down at once. Your people, whom you brought up out of Egypt, have acted perversely. They have turned quickly aside from all that I commanded them. They have now put up a golden calf, and they say, Here is Elohim, the one who led you out of Egypt. Then the Lord said, Go away from me. Leave me alone. Let my wrath burn hot against them so that I may consume them from the face of the earth. And of you I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord, Why would you destroy your people whom you brought out of Egypt? Why should the Egyptians now say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them on the mountain? Turn from your wrath. Do not destroy your people. Change your mind. Remember Abraham? Remember Isaac? Remember Jacob? You swore to them by your own self that you would make their descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. You promised that they would inherit the land and their descendants after them. And the Lord changed his mind about the destruction he was to bring on the people. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Sometimes it's kind of fun when you're thinking about things to have a those people or a them, or in this case, God's people, that you can kind of be snarky about and you can look at them and say, those people are so foolish. 
I mean, it was just a few chapters before this that they got the Ten Commandments. I mean, God was pretty clear about making idols. How could they be so silly, so stupid? How could they now worship a golden calf? But I found a practice that's been helpful in my own life. It's sometimes to get rid of the those people and the they's and instead try to look for a we or maybe a me. So will you imagine with me one person, a one someone in that crowd that day and what they might have been feeling and thinking? Let's wonder together. Have you ever been in a community in the wilderness? It's not so different from being in the wilderness on your own, which is kind of uncomfortable. It's just that now you have people to fight and argue with in the wilderness. In the wilderness that we found ourselves in, we weren't planting or tending to our crops or harvesting. We weren't building anything or taking care of the things we had built. We weren't even sure exactly how much we could dream about. Every day, we would wait for the manna to appear. We would collect just enough for that day, except on the sixth day, then we gathered up twice as much so that we could have it the next day and not have to work on the Sabbath. Sometimes, we would go to Moses and we'd complain, and then something would happen, like quails would appear in the wilderness or water from the rock. And then Moses would go up the mountain and we'd think, yes, this is it. Finally, we're going to get some kind of word from God that we're going to start moving again toward the promised land or maybe he'll give us some kind of instruction, something to break up the absolute monotony every day the same. Moses came down and He didn't usually tell us where we were going or where we were moving, but he would give us some new rules. Some of them were pretty helpful, like thou shalt not murder is really helpful when you are a community in the wilderness together. You need that reminder. Some of it was just really abstract, like let your land rest in the seventh year and make it a Sabbath for your land, which is great if you have land, but if you have no land, it means nothing. Now, Moses was up the mountain again, and he'd been gone a little bit longer than he normally was. And we could see things happening up there, lightning and thunder rolling. But I couldn't stop wondering, what if this is the time that Moses doesn't come back down? What if tomorrow is the day that there is no manna? What if the water stops flowing from the rocks? What if we are just going to die here in the wilderness? We went to Aaron, Moses' brother. He was always better spoken than Moses anyway. And we said, make us Elohim. And he asked us for the rings from our ears. Well, wives and children, but we all willingly took them off. Signs of the fact that we heard God's word. Signs of our own freedom, that we were no longer enslaved. How quick we were to take them off and offer them up. And Aaron made a calf, I'm not sure why. Maybe because the Egyptians worshipped calves and bulls. Maybe because other people around us did. But something happened when we saw it. Finally, something different. Finally, something that could focus our attention. Finally, it was something that was different from every other day. And we said, here is Elohim. And look, I'm not really clear on why, if we were worshiping Elohim, why it mattered that there was a calf there. We understood 
who we were worshiping. But the next morning, I can't even tell you how good it felt to finally have some control over something. We got up early and we prepared all the sacrifices and the offerings of well-being. We sat down and we ate and drank and we reveled and it was every bit as scandalous as you've heard. So good to have something different. It felt exciting until Moses came back down the mountain. And I don't know if you've ever been in a dark room and then someone lights a lamp or brings a torch in and all the things you thought were okay and beautiful look a little dingy and frightening. That's how it was when Moses came back down the mountain and saw us. All of a sudden, I saw it too. How worthless, how insignificant this calf that Aaron had made was. How it failed to live up to Elohim in every possible way. Moses had quite a story to tell. He said, God wanted to eliminate you from the face of the earth, but I talked him out of it. But seeing as how Moses led a bloody rampage when he came down, it made me wonder, was it God that showed the grace or was it Moses? All I know is this. When I heard the words about not making graven images or not making idols, it didn't really connect to anything. I didn't really get it didn't seem to be that strange of a thing for me because everyone around us was doing it too. But then I realized it wasn't about the golden calf. It was about all the anxiety and the fear that led us to create it. And I don't know if you have anxiety and fear where you are, I don't know how you can identify your idols, but I know this, once I saw it, then God shone light into it, and he could heal the fears and the anxieties underneath. And I know it's true for you, too, because that's who Elohim is the one who helps us to see and hold our idols, our fears, our anxieties, and then soothes and comforts and encourages us through them. In his name we pray. Amen.